and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. U.S. President Donald Trump has repeatedly said he wants better relations with Russia. He did finally have his long-sought summit with Vladimir Putin. Both presidents called it a success. The American political class and corporate media described the Helsinki summit as a failure, and Trump even worse. Are the United States and Russia destined to be enemies forever? Cross-talking Russophobia, I'm joined by my guest Brian Becker in Washington. He's the director of the Answer Coalition as well as host of Loud and Clear, a daily news show on Radio Sputnik. Also in Washington, we have Earl Rasmussen. He is the executive vice president of the Eurasia Center. And in Managua, we cross to Dan Kovalik. He is an adjunct professor of law at the University of Pittsburgh as well as author of The Plot to Scapegoat Russia. All right, gentlemen, crosstalk rules in effect. That means you can jump in anytime you want, and I always appreciate it. Uh, Dan, um, when did you finish? writing your book the date uh yes last uh, last year like last spring May, so, May so what last year. what did you know that we didn't know then because it sounds like an absolutely perfect title for the moment in the current news cycle go ahead well uh rush has been a scapegoat of the united states for a long long time uh you know we could go as far back certainly as 1917 but certainly after world war ii we had what you know what was known as the Cold War, uh, which uh, centered upon the vilification of Russia to justify the U.S.'s uh, adventures abroad. And we are in a new Cold War now, and we were in one at the time I wrote the book, and it seems to be only intensifying. Even though the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, uh, the U.S. continues to vilify Russia and, and paint it as some enemy that it's not. Okay, Brian, what, you know, what I find really interesting, and it's a saga that's been going on here, is that it seems to me that very, very often the United States and its Western allies, particularly NATO, they project all of their own sins upon Russia, okay, meddling in other people's election. Well, we could spend an entire month on a daily basis going through all of the meddling that the United States and its allies have been involved in for the last few decades, and it would still be a cursory review. I mean, it, it seems to me that Russia plays this other, the opposite, the negative of what we want to see in ourselves. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, absolutely. I mean, if you if you go through, and people have gone through the record of the United States, not just interfering in other elections, including Russia's. Uh, in 1996, there's that famous Time magazine right. of Boris Yeltsin with the American flag, and it says, Yanks to the rescue, because America flooded Moscow with American advisors and millions of dollars to make sure their candidate, Boris Yeltsin, won. Otherwise, the Communist Party uh, in Russia would have actually been the winner. Uh, but it's not just interference. If the U.S. doesn't like the results of elections oh, yeah. uh, after they've tried to influence them, then they overthrow the government. This is what happened with the democratically elected government of Mohammad Mozak Day in Iran. It dared to uh, nationalize the Anglo-Iranian oil company, now known as BP. So, of course, the U.S. overthrew it and imposed on, on Iran the Shah, a monarch. You can't get a more uh, or less democratic government. There's a long history of this. The United States, uh, the, the media presentation here is so incredible. You had Donald Trump going to Europe, meeting with the NATO countries, demanding that they spend $132 billion more aggregate uh, for really a confrontational position against Russia. And then he gets to Russia, I mean to Helsinki, and meets with Putin. And the American media says this is the surrender the summit. The surrender summit. And acting as if. Uh, yeah. You know, here's the United States spends $780 billion on war every year. Russia spends $60 billion, and yet Russia's on the march. You know, Earl, and, 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 Incredible. and, 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 and Russia's defense spending is on decline right now, okay? It's not being increased here. Uh, Earl, does the United States need Russia as an enemy? Is this the, because to justify all of these expenditures, okay? I mean, Brian is logically looking at it, but logic and politics don't always parlay, okay? I mean, essentially, we need an enemy. It justifies this here. Montenegro is, going to, is adding 
a value added to NATO's defense, okay? Montenegro's army is smaller than the New York police force, okay? But we need an enemy here. Is that what Russia's purpose is? Because it's really easy to paint Russia as, uh, uh, as an enemy it's because, it, because it really demands uh, stubbornly its sovereignty. Go ahead, Earl. No, I, I agree, Pete, Peter. I mean, we, meet, we need, let's face it, it's the defense industry, we need an enemy. Uh, NATO is searching for a new mission. Uh, I mean, really, it's a good defense uh, grouping, but you know, should Russia be included in that as well? And, and what's the real mission? The mission is, is, is not there. I, I don't think there's any fear for Russia invading into any part of Europe. Uh, but um, but it, you, know, you need a boogeyman, you need, an, you need a, a threat to justify defense expenditures. I mean, Dwight Eisenhower, uh, you know, cited, be, be aware of the defense industry. Uh, and, and they all do great things. They do some, you know, positive research. There's a lot of people employed. But, you know, to grow business, you need more threats. And so I think it is, uh, in some ways, it's a, it's a business. It's, um, it's a racket, you know. Uh, and essentially, that's what it is. War is a racket, and uh, conflict is a racket. And then... Uh, a lot of people make money from it. You know, Dan, the, the World Cup just ended here in Russia, and, and Moscow was one of the major centers uh, for, the, for the matches. And uh, I purposely went into the center of town almost every single day and ran into people. Some people recognized me, um, uh, or in a cafe. Um, people would ask me questions or direction or something. We'd get into a conversation. And, and I purposely said, what are you most surprised about? And the reaction was almost universal. People were exasperated. I had no idea this place was like this because in the UK, they tell us a completely different story. They even told us it could be dangerous to come here. And the, and the, and the reaction was anger. Anger that, you know, what the hell were they telling us? Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, no, I mean, the vilification of Russia is, uh, frankly, uh, mind-boggling. Here's a country that right after 9-11, Vladimir Putin was the first world leader to call President Bush and send his condolences. He offered help on, uh, in the war on terror and gave help on the war on terror. Terror. Russia is actually playing a, a very constructive role uh, in the Middle East. Uh, even Israel uh, is finding uh, Russia to be a reliable uh, uh, partner in the Middle East. Um, this vilification has no grounding in facts. Um, and as you pointed out, what appears to be uh, greatly resented in the political uh, halls of the United States is that Russia's gotten back on its feet. Yeah. And it is a country that is livable. And it is a country that people are happy in. And that's why they have a very high approval rating uh, for their president. And, and I think that is why people are surprised when they go there. And it's not some kind of a hellhole because yeah, that's what we're like. You know, and, and, and I should point out to our viewers that Russia is the second country after the United States destination for immigrants. Russia is number two in the world. People do want to come here, though I suppose you would never hear that on CNN. Uh, Brian, you know, another thing is here: it's it, Russia is a reliable enemy, but it's also one. The only bipartisan issue that you get, uh, America's divided political class, it really works, okay? It brings people together, all right? And I think that, that's also its purpose, okay? Is that, um, and it's also a justification for the Democrats why they lost the election, because they still can't come to terms with it. They re remain in denial. Go ahead, Brian. Well, there's another issue that there's a bipartisan support, and the two are closely linked, which is the absolute support for the military-industrial complex and the intelligence agencies. So both the Democrats and the Republicans routinely and almost unanimously support these gargantuan increases in the U.S. military budget. Again, it was an $82 billion increase, increase. increase this year. That's more than Russia's entire military budget. Uh, that was uh, supported by the Democrats and the Republicans. So they come together on this issue, and, and Russia, as our other guests have said, is, uh, is an essential part of the expansion of the U.S. military machine, because what are we going to, why are we going to spend a trillion dollars a year on war? Is it going to be against Grenada? Is it going to be against uh, little tiny countries? You need a major power 
uh, sort of enemy. And then the national security strategy that was unveiled in January, and Trump himself came out to do it, maybe because yes, of his narcissism. Uh, he came out to announce it, unlike previous presidents. It says that the main priority for the U.S. military in the coming decade and decades is not Islamic terrorism, it's not terrorism at all. It's for major power confrontation with Russia and China. That's budgeting, that's budgeting and military contingency planning. Now, to do that, you have to really paint the adversary as an adversary. So it's an article of faith. There's a new religion in Washington, D.C., which is called uh, I hate religion, I, I hate Russia, Russia is the enemy, and we all must bow at, at, and genuflect at the altar of this new uh, religious icon. And that's the way you can take the American people's money, hard-earned yeah. tax dollars, which could be de used for housing and health care uh, and, and the th education, the things human beings need, and yeah. shovel it over to the defense contractors. You, you have to explain to them that it's an absolute national imperative to do that in order to carry out this looting of the national right. budget. Uh, and that's what we're witnessing right, right. now. I mean, let, me go to, let me go to Earl before we go to the break here. Manufactured consent. This is what Russophobia in its most uh, recent incarnation, it's, it's, it's manufactured consent. And, and, uh, and I want to talk about the intelligence community in the second half of the program. But the liberal media loves it and they, they perpetrate it. Go ahead, Earl. 30 seconds. Uh, it, it is manufactured consent, and it's uh, and, and I believe it's probably orchestrated some somewhere in the dark corners as well. I mean, what do we have here? We have McCarthyism 2.0. Even if you shake an ambassador's hand at a reception, yeah. you're ooh, you're uh, you're you're Putin's. Or, in, or that uh, young that uh, young if, lady, if anything, you know, that young so. lady that was just arrested because she was, you know. Uh, she had free. Or she had some kind of agenda here. I mean, be, because she's not a, a foreign agent. Well, hell, half of Washington should be a foreign agent under the, under those uh, uh, strictures here. Okay, I'm sorry, Earl. Let me let me jump in here. We're going to go to a short break, and after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on Russophobia. Stay with our team. Welcome back to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter LeBelt. To remind you, we're discussing Russophobia. Okay, let's go back to uh, Dan and Managua. I think also part of what, what um, uh, Brian was saying, this new religion, uh, as it were, that's so bipartisan and the, and the liberal media loves to propagate, is that why sh I think we should question the intelligence community. I think that's a really important thing to do. I mean, again, if you can go back and look at the history of their behavior, we, I mean, Bay of Pigs, I mean, their involvement in Vietnam, all the issues surrounding 9-11, I mean, uh, there's a lot. I mean, and then you listen to Peter Strzok, okay? I mean, all the more reason to be very skeptical of what's going on behind, you know, closed doors in, in, the, in the deep state here. I mean, I don't understand. It's gotten to the point where questioning anything now, you, you end up being ostracized and demonized. Like, you know, the, le the left wasn't always that way. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, no, I mean, for, for many years, the left understood that the CIA was this pretty diabolical institution that uh, was engaged in regime change abroad and murdering world leaders. Uh, the CIA lied us into the war with Iraq in 2003. Uh, with the lie about weapons of mass destruction, which, of course, you know, uh, led to uh, over a million Iraqis dead, 5,000 Americans dead, and trillions of dollars uh, wasted. And yet those lies are forgotten. And the irony, of course, is that it tends to be the liberals now that are rallying around the CIA and the FBI, the FBI, which is for years engaged in infiltrating progressive organizations and peace organizations to disrupt them, um, who killed Fred Hampton, uh, a leader of the Black Panthers, in cold blood. And now somehow the FBI is supposed to be our hero. I mean, yeah. it's, it's really incredible. You know, Brian, one of the things I think is, is uh, um, very interesting and very tragic here is that somehow uh, Russia meddled in America's democracy. I don't even really know what that means, but you hear it all of the time. But what really is happening, I think, my personal opinion, is that 
because there isn't any questioning of the intelligence community in their behavior, and I'm thinking of the, uh, the FBI during the 2016 election, they are damaging America's democracy because you cannot ask these questions about what they did. I mean, the FBI, the DOJ, was created by Congress, right? They fund these agencies. And what we see is obstruction. So I can't, you know, meddling, okay, I'm not, I have no idea what that really means. But we're getting more and more information that the kind of regime change scenario the U.S. has used around the world for decades has actually come home and they're practicing the same playbook. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, and in fact, that's gone on for decades. The, the, I, I, again, I agree with Dan Kovalik. Why would anyone trust the, the FBI or the CIA? And certainly progressive people or people who used to consider themselves liberal. I don't even know what the word liberal means anymore. Yeah. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, l l what, here's the, 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 the situation is this. The, the U.S. government says that uh, Russia meddled by, by hacking into the Democratic National Committee email server and, and revealing emails that showed that the Democratic Party leadership uh, uh, violated its own rules and regulations to make sure that Hillary Clinton would win the nomination. Now, if that's true, and it's being described as a parallel or, or synonymous with what happened on 9-11 or Pearl Harbor, why did the FBI, why did the FBI not subpoena and take control of that server yeah. to carry out a forensic investigation? Why did it allow CrowdStrike, a third party that had its own self-interest and its own political bias against Russia, why did they take their word that, in fact, the Democratic Party uh, server was hacked by the Russians? That on its face would make anyone skeptical. But again, if you're in a religious situation, you don't need proof. You only take things as an article of faith. And so if the FBI says we have a high degree of confidence without giving any evidence that Russia did this, without any evidence, if you're in a religious mode, you say, I believe. Yeah. I believe because I believe, because I'm part of the religion. And that's the situation right now. If those of us who question this narrative continue to question, we're considered to be non-believers. And like a witch hunt, if you're not part of the witch hunt, you perhaps become a witch yourself. Yep. And it creates an atmosphere of political intimidation. That's what we're experiencing right here in Washington, D.C. You know, and Earl, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know the number on the top of my head, but the NSA, um, isn't it their kind of job to be seeing what's moving around on the internet, you know, from sensitive places and all that? You know, I mean, again, we, we, there, are, there are very intelligent people that are former members of the intelligence community that can make a very strong case that this is like a leak, not a hack. And these people have done it using their, you know, what's in bet between their ears, their brain, okay? They're not, they're, they're not the NSA here. I'm thinking of uh, William Beeney and pe uh, people like that, uh, Ray McGovern. Um, I don't think they're traitors to their country, though they are very, very critical of the places they used to work for. Go ahead, Earl. Uh, absolutely. NSA should be able to isolate down to the building, uh, you know, at, at where the path of traffic was. There, definitely monitoring almost everything, not just foreign traffic, but internal as well. The, uh, but you're absolutely correct on the forensic analysis. So, I mean, where's the real forensic analysis? Where's the independent forensic analysis? The closest thing that's happened is come out of the, um, the veteran, in, uh, you know, veteran intelligence uh, uh, Veeps. organization Veeps. that uh, yeah. Vinny's part of. Hey, right. Veeps, absolutely. That, that's the only thing that's even been close, and that verifies that it had to be an internal leak. Uh, so I'm very, very uh, skeptical on, on any of this you know, uh, Earl, Earl, dialogue let me, going on. Let me on. just jump in here real quickly. I remember, I think, I, I'm going to remember this, Greg. I think it was in January or February of this year that Veeps was actually talking about it. And then months later, months later, Hannity on Fox started talking about it. C consider what the kind of news environment we have. So, some really smart people that know what they're talking about, about, write about this, put it out in public. I think it was consortiumnews.com. And it, it didn't even make a, 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 an impression on the mainstream. And then maybe somebody said, hey, have you read this? Because this is exactly what Hannity would like. But I, for me, it was astounding. So this information was around for months. And it didn't even penetrate. It was amazing. It's a small circle of us. Dan, I want to change gears. Are Russia and the United States destined to be enemies for good? Go ahead, Dan. Well, 
I certainly don't believe, you know, uh, that they're destined to be so. I think, I mean, I believe that there's a lot of common interest there. I think we should be friends and partners. Um, however, I believe, you know, as Eric Hobsbawm, the historian, pointed out, you know, the hatred of Russia is, is in the DNA of, of the American people, and not be, by genetics, but because it was put there uh, by people who have who've found a reason to vilify Russia. But it, it does appear that, uh, you know, the powers that be in this country will continue to stoke the flames of anti-Russia hatred uh, in the interest of war, which will make it very difficult for us to be partners. And I think that's a tragic uh, thing. You know, Brian, I've heard repeatedly um, the uh, Russian meddling, again, whatever that means, is akin to Pearl Harbor. Well, what did the United States do as a reaction to the attack on Pearl Harbor? It, com it completely mobilized its economy and fought a very hard, very bloody war, um, and justified, in my opinion, okay? But what kind of rhetoric is this now? You know. Then, well, then what should the U.S. do? I, I, and, I'm, and then, you know, all of us on this program know the very importance of arms control agreements. I know it's not really sexy for MSNBC and CNN, they, you know, they just have low octane, octane intelligence, okay? But this is important stuff here, and it has to be dealt with. I really wish that Donald Trump had, been, had a little bit more finesse. I know that's hard for him, really hard for him, but that's a really important issue, okay? And I, we need to move forward on that, but if we're going to be enemies, how can you go there? This is one of the great tragedies. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, after September 11th, which is this is being compared to, and Pearl Harbor, the U.S. went to war, war against uh, Japan in World War II, of course, and then after September 11th, the war on terror. Uh, yeah, the U.S., I, be I believe we're past the point of no return in I terms agree. of the, Rus the animus and hostility towards Russia. I don't think we're coming back. Uh, Donald Trump, as you said, uh, all of the media attention was on his a very badly stated positions at, at at the Helsinki but actually what they talked about was Syria and deconfliction they talked about the possibility of improving the star treaty the star treaty was signed in 1991 it said the united states which has 7000 operational nuclear weapons uh, all of which of uh, just a few of which could destroy the entire world and russia which has uh, a similar number, that they should be reduced down to 1,550 and then uh, more. That's a requirement also, in a, uh, an affirmative obligation on, from the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty on all nuclear powers. They talked about that. That was not covered, as you're saying, Peter. That's a big issue. The danger of nuclear war, even an accidental nuclear war, the catastrophic consequences are so profound. Why don't we talk about that? Talk about meddling in the, in the future of the world. Nuclear weapons are meddling in our future. Having control over those nuclear weapons, getting rid of them, that's critically important. That seems to be off the agenda right now. What's, Earl, what I think is really, really uh, tragic in this environment that we're right now is that, you know, negotiations are um, equated with appeasement. This is the tragedy of the conversation right now, okay? And, and, and arms control is so very important. But if you negotiate, it means surrender summit. Go ahead, Earl. No, I, I, I think you're right. It's, it's, uh, personally, I've, this meeting is something that should have taken place a while ago. And, uh, and I think a dialogue is, is def absolutely necessary. Um, are we going to agree in things? Absolutely not. But, but it's definitely, definitely necessary for agreement. And, and for some reason, these major areas of collaboration and, uh, and coordination are not... Um, are bypassed by the media, and it's, and it's very, very unfortunate. Well, we'll see where it goes here, gentlemen, but considering the way things are going, it seems to me that the U.S.-Russia relationship has been spoiled, and it could last for generations. That's all the time we have, gentlemen. Many thanks to my guests in Washington and Managua, and thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time, and remember, crosstalk rules.